everyone to today's webinar. Um, this is now, I'm going to present you um, how to do multi-omics comparative pathway analysis using our new tool called Reactem GSA. I'm Johannes, I'm the technical and scientific lead of Reactem GSA. Um, I will have a few breaks in between the talk um, and I'll ask you question, ask if everyone has questions. So just post them on the chat and I will try to answer them then. So um, quick overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, I'll start with a short introduction about what Reactime and what Reactime GSA is. Um, this will be followed by two interactive tutorials where I'll just try to show you on my screen how to do certain analysis. We'll start with a multi data set analysis using our web interface. We'll move on to how to do a large scale comparative analysis using Reactime GSA R, which is our dedicated R package. And then I'll end with two examples, um, basically just quick walkthroughs, how to do comparative multi-omics um, analysis and single cell analysis. So um, just to start by the normal web-based resources for pathway analysis, most of you have probably used already. Um, so these, use, these resources generally use um, over-representation analyses. And examples of these are Reactome, Tavid, or Panther. And those are the kind of analyses where you just copy and paste a list of identifiers into an input box, a text box, click process, and you get basically your enriched pathways. So the advantage of these tools is they're really easy to use. Again, just copy and paste the identifiers, and they're incredibly fast. The downside of these tools is that you lose or you don't use all your original quantitative information. So this reduces your statistical power. Um, it also means that you have to set the significance threshold on the gene and protein level. If we do the comparative, the actual differential expression analysis and the pathway analysis, we gain a lot of statistical power. Why? Just imagine you have a set of genes that show very small changes between your two groups. So the individual genes will not be significantly different, but if all of these genes belong to the same pathway and you have basically a synchronous change within one pathway, the pathway will be significant and you will not lose this important finding. Um, additionally, in the classical tools, you have to have separate analysis for up and down regulated genes or proteins. It might even be the case that you know, the same pathway is hit in your up and down regulated genes. In this quantitative analysis, we know um, we can take this into, the, into consideration and actually tell you afterwards if a pathway is up or down regulated. So um, what's the problem we actually wanted to solve next to the quantitative analysis? If you do research, if you do multi-omics data analysis, data integration, you often will have the case that you do a study, for example, mouse treatment, you use proteomics, and then you see this great paper, they do something similar, and you want to compare it with them, but they use transcriptomics. And then you might have access to data from a clinical study, but they use microarray data. And you quickly are in a setting where you need to compare omics data from different omic platforms and compare this between species. And of course, you want to integrate public data. So that's kind of the challenge we were looking at here and try to make these kind of analysis really simple and really easy. So our goals are, first of all, it's a multi-omics tool. So basically, it automatically chooses and takes and uses the correct settings for statistical analysis for different omics technologies. At the moment, we support transcriptomics, microarray, and proteomics quantitation data. It's quantitative, like I said, this is a quantitative pathway analysis, so you don't do the differential expression analysis on your gene or protein level, but directly on the pathway level. We also wanted to provide you an interactive visualization. Um, we found it really important that you can interact with your data and really investigate it down to the you know, nitty gritty details, so to say, and this is now done by integrating this in our powerful pathway browser. It should be platform agnostic, um, platform now does not mean your operating system, but your analysis environment. Um, meaning, it doesn't matter whether you start the analysis through a web platform or through the R package, but you can then load the data directly into your R session. So basically, the results from the web analysis can be directly loaded into an R session and vice versa, but I'll demonstrate this later. And public data integration. We really wanted to simplify how you can integrate public data into your analysis, and we have direct links now to Expression Atlas to do this. 
So how does it look like? This is a, basically a workflow scheme. When you use the web-based interface, which I'll show you in a second, you can load public data directly from Expression Atlas, which is another EBI resource. But of course, you can also upload your own data. The web interface then sends it to a central analysis service. And the results are presented to you through an interactive visualization. And if you choose or if you supply your email address, you get an email with static PDF and Microsoft Excel reports. So before I go on, I'll now quickly look whether there were some questions. So um, there's a question about metabolomics integration via Keck IDs. It's a very good point. So we are looking into this. A bit of the issue is that Reactome, and this is something I didn't mention, um, or is Reactome is a human curated pathway database. What does it mean? There are PhD level scientists and how they, that have the job to actually read scientific papers and then create the reactome pathways. This means that you will have a high quality data set here. So reactome pathways are really high quality, but of course coverage is lower. And metabolomics has not been a, a core target of the annotation process yet, but this is going to be enriched in the future. DNA methylation data, ATAC-SEC data, so Officially, we don't support them yet. Unofficially, or, or let's say unvalidated, I think it will work. DNA methylation data, for example, essentially gives you, um, you can aggregate it to kind of the methylation state per gene. And you could express this in quantitative values per gene, and you should be able to upload this kind of data. So same goes by basically for ATAC-SEC data. If you have this kind of data and you want to analyze it and integrate it, do contact us on our ma help mailing list and we'll try to test it with you. Um, but again, the methods we have in place aren't validated yet. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start with the first tutorial, first analysis, how to do an analysis um, using Reactome GSA. And I have this research question that I want to answer now is basically the effect of BRAF inhibitors in BRAF mutated melanoma for those of you who don't know, um, these were one of the first targeted cancer therapies that are used in humans, so it's a really big thing. And I chose two public data sets here. So the first is um, Vimorafenib, which is an FDA-approved clinical drug, versus Control, it's a microarray study, and then a newer study that used this experimental drug, it should also be a BRAF inhibitor, PLX4720, versus a control, and that's a transcriptomics data set. So I'm just going to close my presentation now, and what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to show you how to do this. So first, I'm going to Expression Atlas. Um, Expression Atlas is not the, the key topic here, but it's another EBI resource where you can find lots and lots of public data sets that have been pre-processed using a standard pipeline. So what I just did, I just clicked on human now, and you get this list of available data sets, and you can see all kind of diseases, species are covered here. And if I now click on one of these data sets, um, this is something that we are working on at the moment as well. In the address line here on the top, you can see this identifier um, before the dash results. Um, you have this identifier, and this identifier is the one I refer to in my slides before. So, but now we want to talk about Reactome. So I'm going to the Reactome website. You can reach us on the www.reactome.org. Um, this is live now, so I hope everything works. So this is just the basic Reactome website. We start the analysis by clicking Analyze Data, and this loads a tool which we call the Pathway Browser. So this is Reactome's interactive um, analysis and visualization tool. For the quantitative analysis, you have to click the Analyze Gene Expression tab here on the left. So I'm going to do this now. And it already asks you, and you have three choices for different methods to analyze your data. So what are they? Paddock and camera are our classical gene set analysis algorithms, which means they compare samples of two groups, treatment versus control, or any other groups. Um, and they do this differential expression analysis on the pathway level. SSGSEA is something, uh, is an algorithm which belongs to a group called gene set variation analysis. And this group is a bit different. Gene set variation analysis approaches map your gene or protein level expression values onto the pathway level. It's not just you know summing up or taking the average of the genes, but it's a bit more fancy. 
and statistically sound. And when do you want to use those kind of analysis? So the first two requires that you can put your samples in two groups. So you have treatment control or other comparisons. Sometimes you may just have samples without a classical phenotype. Imagine that you have patients and you measure their survival, right? So of course you could put them in two groups, short and long survival, but this would be a bit arbitrary. So what you can do is you can run a gene set variation analysis. On this, you get expression values per pathway, and then you can correlate these analysis, these values with, for example, the survival time. But here I have my two groups, so I'll continue. I'll continue with paddock. We generally recommend to use paddock because it's was found, and we also saw this in our benchmarks, that paddock is more likely to rank biologically relevant pathways on the top. Camera, on the other hand, is a lot faster than paddock. So if you have very big data sets, you might be happier with camera, or you can use both. So I'm just going to click Next. Now you can add data sets. So when you click Add Data Sets, you have three choices. You can upload your own data, and the choices are RNA-seq, rule counts or normalized, proteomics, we support intensity values and spectral count data, and normalized microarray data. Here I want to, um, we have some prepared examples as well, but here I want to input a data set from Expression Atlas. Here I'm choosing Expression Atlas, and now you have to add this magic ID that I mentioned before. So I'm just going to go back to my slides. I'm going to copy here simply the first ID, going back, and I hit the input button. And what's happening now in the background is that we um, query Expression Atlas Live. So the tool is actually accessing Expression Atlas getting the data for you and, and that's the most important part it also extracts all the metadata available for this experiment here you can add a more descriptive name so I'm just calling this now Vemurafenib um, you click continue because all the metadata is already there and now you have to select the comparison factor comparison factor is your two group comparison okay so I was just asked to go a bit slower I will do that so um, if the is some question about the step that was unclear, just let me know. I'm just trying to continue a bit slower now. So the comparison factor is now the property that you want to compare. So in this case, I have multiple, I'm just going back once more, as you can see, I have multiple properties for every sample. So they have an assay group, cell line, and so forth. And all of these properties are now available here. As you can see, not all of the properties, only properties that have at least two different values. So here I want to compare my compound. First is my reference group. So here I'm using the blank and this is called DMSO. And the second group is now called Vemurafenib, so my treatment group. Um, you can also add covariates. For paddock they are only used for the normalization. What are covariates? Covariates are other factors that you know could play a role but you want them excluded or actually normalized out of your data. Um, for example, batch correction. If you have two sites that did the analysis and you annotated the site, you can select the site here. Here, it's not relevant. So now I click continue, and I'm back at this step two at the data set overview. And now you can see I gave this data set the name Vemurafenib. It has been added. I'm comparing compound DMSO versus Vemurafenib. Now I'm adding the second data set. So for those who didn't catch everything in the first run, I'm doing the exact same thing again. So I go back to my slides. I simply copy and paste the identifier. You enter it in this data set ID field. So just paste it here. And now I click import. And what so what just happened here is since the screen is a bit too slow, it's too small, I'm trying to fix this now. The button to the input was just hidden, so I just click cancel here to do this again. So luckily the developer of our pathway browser is watching now, so I'm forwarding it to him to tell him, please have a look at this bug. So now um, you can see the import started. I clicked import. Here it says queued. Apparently a lot of you are trying this at the moment, so um, our queuing system is already in place. Again, I give a more descriptive name here to this data set. So we go PLX4720. Simply click continue because all the metadata is already there. Select the comparison factor. Again, it's called compound. First group is the blank. Here it's called none. And here the experimental compound. Click continue and I'm done. And now I have two data sets here with my names. 
comparing non-node DMSO, which is the blank, against the compound. You click continue. Now it just asks you whether you want to create the visualization, always keep this to true. Create the report, I suggest you always keep this to true as well. And if you enter an email here, as soon as the comparison analysis is done, you get an email with all the links you need to access the data. Um, if you put your email here, you can click go now and then just close the browser window and the thing will go running. So now the data is being sent to an analysis system and the differential expression analysis on the pathway level, so the pathway analysis is being performed for each of the data sets. And while the analysis is running, I'm just going to look at the, at the questions here. So can targeted proteomics be analyzed through this? Absolutely, um, but of course you have to pre-process your data. I don't know what kind of tool you use, but generally you will arrive at your quantitative, for example, max LFQ values for each protein. And as soon as you have that, yes, it behaves exactly the same way as the proteomics intensity-like values. So all of these are subsumized uh, in this. Is there a template for data sheet for the upload? So um, not yet. Um, in the documentation, so if you go to the Reactome uh, website, there is a documentation link there. Um, if you click on the documentation, you will find that uh, there is a whole part just explaining how you have to format your data. I can um, tell you just now quickly, essentially it is a text file, a uh, tab delimited file that you can prepare in Excel, um, where the first column is a gene or protein identifier and every subsequent column is the sample and their corresponding intensities. Um, so how does the analysis differ from a simple enrichment analysis, for example, by a Fisher exact test? So um, to answer this question, it's quite simple. A Fisher exact test does one thing is you do the protein level or gene level differential expression analysis, then you take your significant genes or proteins and you simply check whether they are in the pathway or how many of the significant path, um, genes are in the pathway versus some kind of background. This analysis is completely different. Basically what you do is you run the differential expression analysis on the pathway level. So the p-value threshold is set on the pathway level and you don't need a background because I have my expression values for my treatment and my control group. So I am complete background agnostic and this is very important if you work in very specific experimental setups. Um, I'm just going through the questions now. Um, how many data sets can we input during one run? Um, quite. In depth, I don't know. We never tried the upper limit. We don't have one at the moment. Just try. Um, should be 10, 20, maybe 100. I don't know. But it works quite well. I'll show you a big analysis later on. Um, would it behave similar to aggregating normalized gene expression for each pathway and doing statistical tests on that? No. Um, it is a bit more sophisticated. I can't go into the details, but the short answer is no. Um, can we compare transcriptome data from different species, mouse, human versus mouse? Absolutely, that's one of the key features. And are both data raw? Does the tool do all the pre-processing steps? Yes, um, it depends on what kind of data you send. So um, for transcriptomics data, it takes, the best thing is raw read count and the pre-processing is done. For proteomics data, no, that's not possible because MS-based proteomics works on the peptide level and we need protein level data. Um, same goes for um, microarray data when you have different probes per gene. Um, we need the gene level aggregation. So as you can see on my screen now, the analysis is done. Um, the reports have been created as well, but I'm going to ignore them at the moment. I'll click here to visualize the results of the gene set analysis. And what you can see now, this is React Home's tree view. And as you can see, it's all the pathways, different colors. The color scheme is explained here. So you have the dark blue. This is significantly downregulated. Not so dark blue is non-significantly downregulated. You have the gray thingy, which is not found. And then we have non-significantly upregulated and significantly upregulated. And for every each data set that you added to the analysis, you now have this kind of um, timeline here where I can click show next and suddenly it jumps to the next data set. Now imagine, remember, these are two BRAF inhibitor compounds tested on BRAF positive cells. So what we expect is they inhi inhibit growth. So look at, I'm going to zoom in here. So let's see how, how smooth that goes here, the cell cycle, super blue, super downregulated, both compounds do the same thing. That's basically what we expect, right? 
But now I'm just going through here and zoom out again, and you will immediately see um, the colors are different. So transport of small molecules is quite different. Um, disease pathways I'm going to ignore for them, but metabolism is quite different. So I'm just going to do this now at random. I'm just selecting, I'm just zooming in here, and I see eukaryote translation initiation. This is really random. I didn't prepare this, and you can see it's super downregulated with ramirafenib treatment, but it's more or less upregulated in PLX471. So let's say I'm really interested in this pathway. You click on the pathway, and if you double click now, something great is happening. Um, it zooms in, and now you have the gene and protein level um, expression values. And these are overlaid. So here I can zoom in even further. You see the actual compound, and you can still use this to see which compound is changing. And basically, you could scroll into this at a super high level of detail. So this tool now gives you the opportunity or allows you to investigate. I'm going back to the overview here. Um, basically, from the big pathway picture down to the single gene level of the differences. And in the background, what we do is um, we map everything to human space. So if you have multi-species comparisons here, everything is mapped to a common pathway space. I now click the, this kind of spider web image on the top. And what's happening now is um, the tool is loading a new visualization, which is called Voronoi Maps. And what they do is they try to give, use more of the space that we have in the browser to display the pathway values. So what you can see is you have these more or less hexagons for the different pathway types. You can again click here to see the different compounds. And now you can easily see how big the differences are. And please imagine these are both BRAF inhibitors, but their effect, apart from cell cycle, on other pathways is huge. So you can see very quickly, I did a multi-data set, multi-omics. This was microwave versus transcriptomics data analysis for, um, for one compound. So I'm now going to go to the questions again. Is there a way to preserve a paired structure of replicate comparisons? I'm not sure I understood the questions, um, but if you have a data set, so, so we support paired structures in the way that you can say, if for example, you have a treatment timeline, like the same patients before treatment, after treatment, you can add the patient as a covariate, and then yes, it is doing a paired test. So this is taken into consideration then. Um, great, apparently I answered the question. I'm happy about this. So now I'm going to continue. Um, the first tutorial is done, and we're going to continue now with the presentation. Let's see. So I just showed you so how you can do this multi data set comparison using our pathway browser. One thing I didn't show you, and it just comes to my mind, is that I'm going to go now here. I forgot to show you the reports. So how do the reports work? Um, you remember I closed this screen here by clicking click to visualize gene analysis. I'm just going to do this again to show you. So when you're here, you can click this analysis button on the top to go back to the screen. Why is it important? Because here you have the reports. And I'm going to open them now quickly to show you what kind of reports you get here. So um, the first is an MS Excel report. I'm just going to go to open this now. Um, I have a two screen, two monitor system here. So I just have to drag this to the right monitor. So now what you get is a standard Excel file. We have First of all, the overview. So this is the pathway overview. You have all the different pathways that are present in Reactom. And then you get the direction, point, sample name. So it's really important, a data set name, sorry. So it's really important to give sensible short names to your data set. So here, direction with Morafenib, FDR, p-value, how many genes were found, and all the relevant statistics. And then if you scroll down, you get the same thing for PLX4720. Additionally, we also give you the gene or protein level fold changes for the data sets here in different genes. So you can actually use this as a, as a neat tool to quickly um, combine this. One thing you immediately see, Vemorafenib uh, as an identifier, apparently used, um, these probably are entree IDs, while PLX4702 used ensemble identifiers. This mapping is also automatically done by our tool, and it's done in a way that we preserve most of the structure because we have an issue with the M to N mapping. So for example, one gene might map to three, um, so one uniprot identifier could map to 
um, three ensemble identifiers or vice versa. And what we do is we map them directly to the pathway. So if one of your identifiers maps to three Uniprot identifiers, which we use internally, then but all of them belong to the same pathway, your entries only edit once to this pathway. I'm going to close this Excel sheet now, and I'm going to the PDF report. The PDF report is just a, a bit nicer to look at. at. You get this reactive analysis report with kind of a volcano pathway level plot. It looks sometimes a bit odd like here um, for your data sets. Then you get kind of a, a bar plot, how many pathways are significantly found in one or two of the data sets. And now something nice, you get this overview, this correlation plot where you can immediately see, I'm going, just going to zoom in here a bit, um, where you can immediately see most of the pathways behave similar. So they are downregulated in Memorafinit, downregulated in PLX4720. But there's a group of pathways here in this corner that is actually downregulated by Memorafinit, but upregulated in PLX4720. It's the same thing we just saw in the interactive visualization. But if you scroll down, you get now a list of pathways that show the same regulation that are significant in at least one of the data sets. And I'm going to scroll down here now. Sorry, it uh, takes a bit. And then we get differently regulated pathways. And these are pathways now, and I'm just showing you the first one. For example, notch signaling um, is significantly downregulated by Vibrafenib, but significantly upregulated by PLX4720. And this is really a great way to just quickly see what are the differences, what are the same things um, between my pathways. And now if you want to look at this pathway, I'm just going to copy this reactome identifier here. I'm now going to close this this um, analysis view, going back to the pathway browser, closing here, and here I can now use this search tool, paste the identifier here, click enter, I have the pathway, it's now selected in the diagram, and you can zoom in here, and now you have this really interesting pathway in the overview table, you see it's downregulated with Rafanib, upregulated in PLX4720. Surprisingly, this is one of our, you no. Know, publication level overview images that were all, all drawn by a special graphics designer. And now you can again jump between the different data sets. You see everything is happening here in this pre-notch expression. You can double click on the pre-notch expression and now you go down to the gene or protein level view. Again, you can click here to see which of these are changing. And if you scroll in here, this is quite fun. Um, you see here we have pre-notch, um, one to four, here pre-notch two is upregulated by in treatment, but actually downregulated by PLX4720, while all the other pre-notches seem to be upregulated. This is just um, a nice example. So um, quickly looking at the questions, there's the question, how does the FDR control work for the analysis? Uh, quite simple, we get p-values on the pathway level, um, and then these p-values are corrected by Benjamini Hochberg. Um, next question is, what if there are no predefined groups of cases and controls like a general population samples? Then you use um, the SSGSEA um, analysis. I'm going to show this later. Next question, can I combine multi-omics analysis? Um, yes, you can. This is a multi-omics analysis. It's transcriptomics and um, microarray data. Can we download process data of microarray and RNA-seq data? Well, the maximum we give you is the Excel sheet essentially, where you have the full changes on the gene protein level and the over, overall pathway analysis. That's the deepest level of data you get from us. Internal data we can't really expose to the system design. So now I'm going on. Um, we come to the next part, and which is the Reactem GSAR package. So Reactem GSAR package is in Bioconductor. It supports all the common um, data models and objects for omics data. So this is the summarized experiment, the DGE list from HR and the E list from Lima. Um, all of them are supported by the central add data set function and it does the same thing as the web interface. It just adds data sets to one analysis request. The R package then sends the data to our analysis service. So it doesn't do the calculation on your computer, but on our service. Why? Because that's the way we can then give you the interactive visualization. And then you have some plotting functions. So the correlation plots, the volcano plots, the ones that you saw in the PDF report, they are actually done through this R package and you can do them then yourselves as well. Um, 
And again, I'm going to show you how this R package works with a tutorial. Um, I'm just giving you the background. So um, my research group is really interested in B cells. We found we're one of the first, first to show that B cells are really important to anti-tumor immunity and that they are um, activated through nf kappa B signaling. Now, the biology isn't really important to you, but the big question is now, does this effect differ across different cancer types? So how can we address this? Um, it's TCGA. So TCGA, for those of you who don't know, is a huge um, US effort to do deep omics characterization of human cancers. It's, it's one of the biggest studies there. They selected several cancers to study, and for each of these cancers, they collected up to 500 samples from patients, and then did a follow-up of these patients up to 10 years. So you have transcriptomics, genomics, sometimes proteomics data from these samples, including the clinical data. So it's a huge and great data set, and the TCGA guys also have a bioconductor package where basically you can use this GDC query tool to quickly download the data. And what I'm doing here, I'm just downloading here with this R script. I'm not going to do this live because it's a huge analysis. Um, I'm downloading here the data for a lung Arduino carcinoma. So this is the standard workflow in Bioconductor. It's nothing to do with our tool. You get the results. You, you find lots of you know cancer samples here. And now comes the great thing. Um, I'm simply compare, converting this to a GG, DGE object, sorry about that, um, which is used by Edge R. So again, we are still in standard Bioconductor processing. We just map the counts to the counts, um, the sample metadata, and so forth. The only thing that I added here was the B cell number. We, we have a way to estimate B cell numbers in samples. I did that as well. And now you want to do the analysis. And this is now our package. It's really easy to use. You load the package with the library command, library React Home GSA. You create an analysis request. So going back to the web interface that you saw, it's similar to opening the web interface. You just say which method you want to use. Here again, I'm using Paddock. You set some overall parameters. Here I say use interactors is true in the web interface as the default. This means that we use protein-protein interaction data to enrich Reactam's pathways. So that's why we have a bigger coverage. Um, and we don't include disease pathways. Why? That the disease pathways um, can skew your results quite a bit. So generally, we recommend you don't include them in your analysis. And that's how you create an analysis request. And now you simply add the data set. How do you do that? You have the analysis request, you say add data set, analysis request, expression values, and now as expression values, you just pass the DGE object. Nothing has to be changed here. You give it a name, you say what type of data this is, it's the same as selecting the type of data before, where here I say it's rna sec row count. What do you want to compare? Again, the same thing like in the web interface, here's the TIBB group, this is the group that I added to this data set about the lots and few B cells, and what do you want to compare? Group one against group two, low versus high. And then you simply, you can repeat this, of course, multiple times. You run the analysis by simply say, perform react analysis using this request, store the result here, and you're done. And you basically replicated everything you did in the web shell, in the R session, sorry. How does the result look like? And what I'm showing you here is a pathway analysis across five TCGA data sets. This means, in total, I think, we processed 2,500 samples here. This is kind of how much, how far this scales. Um, doing such an analysis takes about 20 to 30 minutes, about, depending on system load. In these cases, we really recommend you use the email function and you get notified as soon as the analysis is done. But the analysis is super powerful, as you can see, because, remember again, I was looking for B cells, right? B cell rich versus B cell poor samples. And what you can immediately see, just in the, in the, in the color, right? In, in melanoma, this is the cancer we studied, um, it's upregulated. You know, in, in samples with lots of B cells, B cell receptor signaling and activation through nf kappa B is upregulated. In ovarian cancer and breast cancer, you also see a similar effect. But here on the left, Lung Arduino carcinoma has the opposite effect. Now, this is, of course, extremely fascinating to people who work in this kind of field, but I guess most of you can imagine some kind of multi data comparison where you can do something similar, where you can then suddenly quickly see across a lot of studies, these are five huge studies, whether the same effect is present in these samples. And then you can further investigate using the pathway browser and 
our interactive visualization. How can you do that? So before I go here, I'm actually going to close this again and just show you because I kept this open. I go back to my report here. So I'm clicking the analysis again. And what some of you saw, I, I think in the, um, on my right left screen, I saw a question here. You see this R script here. I deliberately didn't mention this before. So I'm clicking the R script now. And this is opening a simple text file. I just have to see in which part of my screen the text file is now opened. Okay, it's actually open in RStudio. It doesn't matter. We can just use it like this. And you can see this is the R script that was just downloaded. And this R script contains all the code you need to install React on GSA in case you haven't got it, load it, and load this exact result that I created using the web interface into your R session. So what I'm going to do just to prove it to you, I'm just going to copy this. And now I'm going to open a very basic text-based R shell. I'm going to paste the data here. And you can see this is happening. Just so it's loading the analysis. It's accessing our API. Um, it's loading the result on, into the R session. Um, and as soon as the loading is done, I will now have all the data that you just saw in the web interface directly into my R session. So why is this loading now? Apparently, a lot of you are currently trying. Ah, it's here. You just enter results to use the standard R print function, and you can see I have two data sets, Vemorafenib and PLX4720. Now, if you start it from the R session, right? If you started your analysis here, you can do the following thing, because here you say react on visualizations. There is a visualization there. You can use the command still in the R session, open react home, and you say result, and click enter. And what's happening now, it gives you the URL, and actually opens the web browser and opens the pathway browser. So what's ha going to happen now, and we just wait a second, is that all the results that were created in the R session are now available in the pathway browser. And as you see, this is open Firefox because it's my standard browser. But here, I have the same data set again. So that's what we meant with system agnostic. It doesn't matter whether you started the analysis in R, or through a web browser, you can jump between the two interfaces um, without any problem. I'm just going to close this now, and I'm going back to my presentation, and I'm going to look at the questions now. So, um, first question, um, do we have to have the same individuals for all omic types of data set? No, absolutely not. The, the, the studies you compare here can, can be completely unrelated. I'm going to show this later. So it doesn't matter what you compare. Um, the data set analysis themselves, so the analysis of one data set is independent of the analysis of another data set. Another question, um, can we have a different number of samples? Absolutely. Again, the data sets can be completely independent. Can the R script customized for the figure output alterations? Unfortunately, I don't understand this question, so you can create all the blots from the PDF report through the R session. There's, of course, a vignette there that shows you how to do this. But um, if I didn't answer it correctly, please let me know. Can I create the R markdown report in R as well, or only view the web tool? If so, how do I do that? Um, great question. Um, this was by um, the user. So um, yes, this is actually done through a package that's called reactmgsa.report. It's not in Bioconductor, but it's on GitHub. Um, that's the package we use. So yes, you can you do this locally. It's absolutely no problem. Um, how long will the results be stored on the server? Um, so that's a very good question. Um, the, the results are stored on the server um, generally a few days. Um, so why do I say this so, so, so randomly? Um, because we have an automatic cleanup routine depending on system load. But generally, um, not longer than a week, then they are gone. Um, and we don't really have a way to preserve them. Um, can I download it such that I can visualize from R anytime? Absolutely. Um, the R script, and I'm actually going to show this to you live on my screen because it's a really cool question. And we, um, this is one of the few cases where we actually thought of this. So I'm going to open the R script now again, um, this time using the text editor, but because I think it's a bit, sorry, that should not happen. So I'm just going to open in R Studio because actually if you execute this R script, I'm just going to put it on my screen now. If you ex uh, execute this in your R session, so I'm just going to go through the script quickly, uh, loads the library, fetches the result, and actually the third command here is saving the result. 
So if you just copy and paste this R script, you actually automatically save the result on your hard disk just for that reason. And then you can, you know, keep it forever and create plots and reports and what what's not from it. Um, can we upload data sets from Geo? Um, unfortunately, no, not yet automatically. So of course you can do it if you download the data and find it. Um, we don't have an automatic link to Geo yet for the very simple reason that um, since you apparently work with geodata, um, geodata is quite unstructured, meaning that it's not always apparent where we can find the gene level data. You know, some gene uh, geodata sets only have sample level data, they have no aggregation there, some only have some random zip or text file associated with it. So it's really difficult to automatically find the right file. So that's why we don't support it yet. But we are working on an implementation with Grind, which is a reprocessing for geodata sets. Um, but it's not done yet, so what you can do is you go to Grain. I'm going to just to go to post this on the chat. This is called Grain. Um, if you Google it, you will find it. Um, and they pre press geodata sets. You can la download the expression matrix from this tool and then upload it to our tool using the standard upload function. How do you handle missing values in the data set? Um, so this, missing values aren't too bad for us because we project everything to the pathway level and therefore um, they don't play such a huge role. So yes, they're taking into consideration. Uh, can you do an example of user data upload to see how the format should be? Um, this is an absolutely great question. And of course I didn't prepare for it. So um, I can just show you how to do it because I just don't have the fi a file on me. So if you click on analyze gene expression, um, I'm just going to go back because here, so you click the add data set, uh, you have the different counts here. When you click here, it actually opens, you can't see it properly because my screen is too small here. Um, it opens um, uh, an explorer window where you can select the file to upload and then just select it and it will be uploaded. Sorry, I don't have an example here, but we'll put one in the documentation. Um, will non-model species also be covered in the near future? Um, so. The number of species supported by Reactome is growing continuously. Um, I can't give you a proper answer about the timeline uh, when we have the other species um, supported. This is a bit tricky to do properly because for most non-model species, we don't have accurate mapping from human protein identifier to their respective species. Is there a way to load data sets from Pride and Protein Exchange? Uh, great question. So the problem with so for those of you who don't know, Pride and Protein Exchange are repositories or a group of repositories to store MS-based proteomics data. Now, in MS-based proteomics, we don't have any kind of standard format for quantitative results. Um, ArrayExpress has some proteomics data there and you can load it into our tool directly. But if you want to have data from a Pride data set and they only uploaded the raw data, you actually have to do the quantitation yourself and then provide us with the protein level quantitative values. Unfortunately, um, and you know, all the steps of peptide inference and so forth are in between there, so we can't do this automatically. Would phosphoproteomics work? How do you map phosphoprotein information to protein names IDs? Um, the short answer is no. And the reason is simple. If you do phosphoproteomics, so we did a test where we mapped the phosphorylations, the site-specific phosphorylations on the pathways. But what happened was we lost all the data. Why? Because in a pathway, if you annotate it based on literature, right, you know that a very specific phosphocyte is relevant to this receptor or pathway. In phosphoproteomics, generally, we don't have the coverage to detect that one exact phosphorylation, but you find lots of other phosphorylations which we don't have the data for. So this kind of generally causes you to lose a lot of data. That's why you can upload your data, but we can't take the site-specific phosphor information into consideration. Um, this is just a, a basically a coverage problem. So I'm going to go continue now with my uh, presentation and because there was one question about multi-omics comparison, and this is just an example. So as you can see, it's R code again. I stick with the TCGA example. It's again the breast cancer. But for, for some of the TCGA samples, there was um, another project called CPTAC, and they did quantitative proteomics. So this was apparently one of the questions. And here you can actually get this proteomics intensity data. So I, I got this data, I matched it. So it's the exact same samples here. 
only fewer. So here it's about 500 samples. In the, in the proteomics, it's about 150 samples or a bit less. And I got the intensity data. And I do the exact same thing, right? I use the F data set function. The only difference now is the type here is RNA sec count data. Here is proteomics intensity data. So you add it to the same request. You click perform. And what you I now get as a result, and here's just the plot, you get for the TCGA breast cancer, so that's the transcriptomics data, and the CPTAC, that's the proteomics data, same samples. You see most of the pathways are regulated in the same direction. The fold change might differ a bit, but it's the same direction. But again, there's a huge group of, or some group pathways here that are only up-regulated on the transcript level, but are down-regulated on the protein level. And using the R, so this is actually, you see, uh, just an output from the R session. Um, you can see that these pathways that are upregulated in the TCGA but downregulated in the proteomics data set are really important to, to cell growth and cancer immunology. For example, here we have um, interleukin 20 signaling or interleukin 7 signaling, integrin signaling, EGFR signaling is upregulated on the transcript level and downregulated on the protein level. So if you have such a multiomics experiment where you have transcriptome and proteome data, from the same kind of experimental setup, it's really easy to compare these on the pathway level. Finally, one feature that's only available in our R package is the analysis of single cell transcriptomics data. Um, we created a dedicated function. It's called analyze SC clusters function, and it supports both SORAD and the single cell experiment. And single cell experiments, for those of you who don't know, is the standard data format in Bioconductor for single cell data. SORAD, those of you who work with single cell um, transcriptomics data in R probably know it is one of the most common tools. We support both of them. And what kind of the question you can answer with it. So this is again B cells in melanoma. And here I extracted the B cells from a public data set from Jerby Anand and L. And if I annotate them, I can see I have some plasma blasts here. I have some naive B cells here, I have some double negative B cells, and so forth. So there are some phenotypes. But this huge bulk here in the middle, and you can see I call the memory zero to memory six, um, are all annotated as memory B cells, but they form distinct clusters, so they're quite different. And now I want to know what is the difference here. And the way you do it now is I have my data in this object called B cells, that's my solid object. You say analyze SC clusters, you again get the results, so I'm still in the R session. And this now does a gene set variation analysis. So this tool actually uses the SSGSEA analysis. Why? Because here I don't have phenotypes, right? I just have my cell clusters. I can't really say compare clusters one to three against the other clusters. No, I want to actually get some information about them. And what I now get is for a specific pathway. So here I chose the B cell receptor pathway. You now get pathway level expression values for your different cells. So as you can see, this B cell receptor signaling is really high in memory switched resting cells, but super low in double negative. And then I can now you can go through your clusters and actually look at them on the pathway level. You can also plot this as a, as a heat map, where you can see again, how do they differ, right? The downstream signaling of the B cell receptor is really low in the double negatives, but it's quite high in the plasma past. And you can, that's how you can basically do a pathway analysis, a functional analysis, of your single cell transcriptomics data using our R package. Should you be interested in this, um, you can find, I'm just going to jump now live to the Bioconductor Reactome GSA website. So apparently I misspelled something, Bioconductor Reactome. So here it is. And you have the, and here we provide two vignettes. Um, the first is how to analyze single cell data. And the second is a general vignette, how to use the Reactome GSA package. If you look at them, you can then find them, just this the single cell stuff. You can actually go through the complete analysis of how to get the data, how to do the analysis, and how to then, you know, compare different pathways between your clusters of cells. So, finally, um, just for those who are technically interested, um, Reactome GSA is actually a Kubernetes application, so the application monitors itself and automatically scales to demand. So if all of you tried at the moment at the same time, our application probably started a few additional servers to cope with your requests. And as I told you, both the Pathway Browser, so the web-based interface, as well as the R package, access the same API. And should you be a software developer, should you write your own scripts, 
this API is publicly available and publicly accessible and documented. So if you want, you can actually directly interact with our API and send your analysis request directly to us and also get the results and the link to the visualization directly through the API. Um, so a final summary. Um, I hope you enjoyed this webinar. I hope I could show you that React MGSA is, um, we have a really neat tool to do multi-omics quantitative pathway analysis. We support proteomics, transcriptomics, and microarray data. Two ways to access the application at the moment, the pathway browser and our R package, React MGSA. Again, it's a multi-omics analysis system. It's multi-species, so we support a lot of species that you can add to the same analysis. And it's a quantitative information, and it gives you this interactive visualization of your quantitative results on the pathway browser. Most importantly, thanks to all the people that work with me on this project, the EBI team who's responsible for all the implementation in the pathway browser and the great visualization and the data that we actually use, and from my group, um, my PhD student who's working on the data validation. Now, I'm just putting on this slide, if you're interested in additional resources, the pathway browser is accessible on the React and website. The project documentation with links to additional tutorials is available on reactome.github.io slash reactomegsa. And I didn't even put the Bioconductor URL here because it's really ugly. Just enter reactomegsa on the Bioconductor search page, and then that's how you can find it. Now, I'm just going to look at the questions before I stop. Um, let's give me a second. Will you implement RAST or similar mapping for non morgul organisms um, so you can map RNA-seq proteomics data for these? Um, that's a very good idea. We haven't thought about this yet, is the honest answer. Um, we might take it up. Next question is, can you also analyze higher dimensional data, for example, longitudinal studies, where you would be looking for differential regulation between sets of samples? So at the moment, no, we only support two samples. So if you have such a longitudinal setup, you really need to select which time points you want to compare. We, we don't support these more complex at the moment. Hi, is it possible to upload uh, a series matrix TXT file for analysis? Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with a series matrix TXT file. Uh, maybe you can just put on the chat what exactly this is. Um, why are the raw counts RNA-seq recommended as input and not, for example, DA-seq2 normalized counts? Uh, quite simple, because we, um, as I told you, we run the differential expression analysis on the pathway level. This is similar to running DSEC2 on the pathway level. And as you know, um, DSEC2 and, and Lima and all those tools, they really work a lot better with the raw read counts. Um, so we can run a more appropriate differential expression analysis. Otherwise, it can get ugly quite quickly. But we do support a lot of normalization functions. Um, so you can, if you need normalization, which you generally need um, in your data set. Are there any Python scripts for interaction with the API run? Not yet. If you're a Python programmer, um, please contact us on the web, on the help mail, um, and we are happy to collaborate. Um, but we know we haven't created a Python package yet. Um, so um, thanks for all the nice wishes here. Um, so if there are no more questions, um, thank you all for your attending attendance, um, and thanks for all the the great interaction.